awesome FP is, and you wish that they would just, oh yeah, okay, great, great. Um, and how many of you who are already using functional programming languages at work uh, wish that your company would adopt them more, would use more of it? No? Okay, you, you guys are 100% FP already. Yeah, okay, that's okay. Um, also, <coughs> this is a story about how our company transitioned from Java to Haskell. And hopefully you guys uh, will, can take away some tips about how to maybe convince your organization to make the jump. Uh, first of all, let me tell you that uh, our company is, at, things move quickly in the startup world. And actually, as of two weeks ago, we've rebranded from Summel to Odeco. Um, as Odeco, uh, what we do is we use machine learning to do predictive ordering and inventory management for small coffee shops and cafes. Um, previously, as, as Summel, we were doing uh, data analytics in the social media realm. Uh, and our Haskell transition happened while we were sort of in that form. Yet another sidebar before we begin. Java. As much as we, especially the people in this room, we like to like trash Java, uh, it was a really good thing for the software in industry. You know, uh, in, it, in its heyday in the late 90s and uh, 2000s, uh, it really was like an order of magnitude uh, improvement over what was before. Right? You know, you had some great things, uh, uh, better object-oriented features. You had, you know, you could manage memory. You didn't have to free your own pointers. Uh, and, you know, it had decent web libraries. And, of course, the familiar C-style syntax. Uh, so Java was really, was really a 10x change, really revolutionary for the industry. So then why did we move away from Java? Well, in June of 2014, this is, this is what we looked like at Sumol. We had eight. Java developers, uh, at least on the back end, we had eight Java developers. Um, we had a monolithic Play app. Uh, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the Play framework. Uh, we were on like the original, really old version of the Play framework that was on Java. Uh, nowadays, it's Scala. Um, and we were not having a good time. We, our development speed was slow. Uh, we, you know, it, it's a big monolith, lots of spaghetti code, very difficult to make changes without screwing something up terribly. Uh, maintenance cost was high, and developer satisfaction was low. Okay. Uh, so as a solution to this, we decided to let's stop using this monolithic print thing and let's move to a microservices architecture. And by moving to this architecture, that gives us an opportunity to go polyglot, to use some different languages. A bunch of, uh, we can use a bunch of different languages together, perhaps even. Um, so why, so OK, we can use different languages is now, uh, but why FP? Why functional programming? So point number one, we wanted to find out, well, could functional programming be the next revolution, be the next 10x change like Java was 10, 15, 20 years ago? Okay. And the next thing was um, a recruitment differentiator. Uh, Java shops and Python shops are a dime a dozen. Uh, we can say, hey, we're a Java software company. Uh, here's our job posting. Please come work for us. You know, but we really look like all the other Java shops out there. But if we say, hey, we are using functional programming in you know, whatever FP language, hey, that differentiates us. That makes us a little bit special. And perhaps that will allow us to more easily recruit. Um, so why Haskell in particular? You know, there are a number of different uh, functional programming languages. And you might think, hey, we were on Java already. It would be pretty easy or easier to just stick with the JVM, uh, move to Clojure or Scala or something like that. Um, well, as part of the um, transition to microservices, we wanted to use Docker. And JVM on Docker is problematic. You like have this giant container on top of another container, and you, know, you, you might screw up some things with mem and resource management. So for us, that eliminated Scala and Clojure. We wanted multi-core support, and that eliminated OCaml for us. So we, we wanted to compile down to some native code instead of the running on the JVM, and we wanted multi-core support. And also, we figured, hey, if we're going to go to functional programming, let's go all the way. Let's go to the strictest, most awesome functional programming language um, that didn't allow us to cheat right, and use uh, OO uh, features like like in Scala, you know, you, you can cheat. So let's not do that. 
Um, well, if we're going to go all the way, why not go to something like Idris? Well, I mean, at the time, and perhaps so now, no, not, not quite production ready. Uh, it, and uh, it didn't have a, a large enough community that we were comfortable with just jumping in. So we chose Haskell. And, uh, and actually, we already had a person on our team that was really big Haskell fanatic, a Haskell expert. So of course, that helped our decision as well. Um, as it turns out, moving from Java to Haskell is really not that much different from any other kind of big organizational, uh, organizational change. Uh, the, most, of the, most of the work, most of the uh, resistance you might get is political not technical, right? And in order to affect any kind of change, organizational change, you really have to do these three things. You have to gather your champions, you have to convince the people who are undecided, and you have to outrun the detractors. So who were our champions? Uh, at the beginning of this, uh, of this, I guess, movement, uh, our, there's a guy whose name is Todd, who actually was supposed to give this presentation to me, but he couldn't make it on the trip. Uh, he's our current CTO, but at the time he was uh, actually not our CTO. He was merely a very senior engineer. Um, we also had one senior distributed systems developer who was the Haskell expert. Uh, and we also had another senior full stack developer. And these were our champions who wanted to push for the uh, Haskell. Now very, very fortunately for us, our CEO at the time and our CTO at the time were very receptive to this change. They were really, they really wanted to innovate the company to innovate. So convincing them, fortunately, was not a big problem. Uh, it turned out it was actually more of a problem to convince the rest of the engineering team. Uh, so our next step, so we have our champions. And the next step was to convince undecideds. Uh, now, Haskell is notor known for being notoriously difficult to learn. Whether or not that is really true, uh, perhaps well, perhaps it's true because most most people come from an OO background and it's difficult to switch to FP. Uh, perhaps if somebody learned FP from day one, it might be easier. But the practical reality is Haskell is difficult to learn. Right? Uh, so we decided to run an experiment. We wanted to see if we can train somebody who was like a Java only developer to become a uh, successful Haskell developer in, you know, in a reasonable amount of time uh, so that we can convince all the other people who are undecided and quite frankly the, um, convince our champions too that this was possible. Uh, this, this developer uh, did Java all throughout college, all throughout their career, uh, died in a world Java person. Um, this developer was also a very good looking person. Uh, it, it was me. <laughs> So um, how, uh, what, what, what resources did I use to learn Haskell? Well, back in my day, uh, in 2014, uh, we, uh, Haskell uh, Programming from First Principles ebook wasn't out yet. Some of you may be familiar with this book. Um, I think it's considered like the gold standard nowadays for, uh, uh, for learning Haskell. It's a very good book, but back then we didn't have that. Uh, so what I used was there's a really great course uh, given by the University of Pennsylvania uh, called CIS 194, and they make all of the um, teaching materials online uh, for free, and that's that's what I used uh, primarily. I also used Learn Your Haskell, you've probably seen that one before, and a lot of support from my colleagues, uh, especially uh, the ones who knew Haskell already. So, uh, what happened? Hey, success! I did it. Uh, Took me a while. It took me like two months, almost full time, to really for me to really be comfortable uh, uh, developing Haskell by myself on my own. Um, and I felt stupid a lot of the time. I felt really stupid, and to this day, I still feel really stupid sometimes uh, learning Haskell and using Haskell. Um, so, so I just want to let you know that uh, it's okay if you also feel stupid when you learn Haskell. It happens. Uh, so after this successful experiment, uh, our roster of champions was, uh, again, our, our senior developer who, was, uh, who is now our CTO, but at the time was like our VP of engineering, uh, our one Haskell expert, our, uh, we had one intermediate Haskell guy. And we, after I went through the experiment, uh, we also had another person come and learn uh, Haskell. So we had two Haskell meetings as well. So this was our Haskell team.
And so now that we have this roster, we are ready to start developing some new stuff in Haskell. Uh, so what do we need to do? Uh, we had to change our continuous integration uh, frameworks to be able to handle Haskell. As a Java-only shop before, we only did, you know, uh, we only handled Maven with Nexus and all that stuff. And now we had to switch to uh, using GHC and Cabal for package management. And even back then, uh, Stack was not around. The Stack beta, I, I, I looked this up the other day, the Stack beta didn't come out until 2015, which seems eon, like eons ago. I, I cannot imagine life uh, without before Stack now. And uh, he's not here right now, so I guess I can show this picture. But a uh, special thank you to FP Complete, Tomiko Slim, and the GOAT for uh, giving us Stack. Um, uh, of course, in addition to uh, changing our uh, build infrastructure, we also had to write a bunch of new code. Had to rewrite a bunch of existing uh, business logic. Um, and that, but unfortunately, during this period, we were also doing that re-architecture to uh, microservices. So there was a lot of opportunity to write some clean sheet stuff, which is very helpful if you're trying to move to a new language. Uh, so we uh, wrote a bunch of new services. Uh, it took us a little while to settle on a web framework. Uh, we used Snap, then Scotty, and then we finally decided on Servant. Uh, yes? How do you handle the development and development of developers? How do you handle the change in development and development? Does it support cross compilation in a seamless manner? So developers need to have a say in like Linux, desktop, and desktop. Um, the question was, how do we handle um, uh, like cross compilation, um, uh, and how did uh, developers? Uh, do we have to have developers on the same like local exactly. environment? Well, the the answer is uh, so there was a sub uh, a subset of the engineers who were working on Haskell, and by and large, they were all on Linux Ubuntu laptops, and uh, everyone else who was not working on Haskell uh, were uh, either on Macs or Ubuntu. So uh, some more code that we needed to write is uh, we had to write our own uh, Netflix Eureka client. Uh, Netflix Eureka is a, a framework built by Netflix uh, for service discovery. Uh, this is the thing we were using at the time. And uh, while well, Netflix uh, gives you a Java client, it gives you a Scala client probably, uh, but they're not going to give you a Haskell client. So we had to write, write our own. Uh, and we finally had to learn how to version software properly. Uh, in the Maven world, if people are familiar with Maven, whenever you do a build and a release, it just picks up the patch number for you automatically, and you don't even think about it. And so that version number is like completely meaningless. You have versions like 4.2.587 or something like that. Uh, but to, to really use Haskell properly, use the managed dependencies properly, uh, we really need to finally learn how to use Semver. Okay, cool. Uh, so, but even after you learn Haskell and you can code in Haskell, there are uh, things you should do to make your day to day life easier. Okay, so we adopted a couple of policies that made it easier to work in Haskell day to day. Uh, number one, uh, this is a very specific thing. Always use explicit imports, please. Um, that first line, import data.txt, that is the equivalent in, let's say, Java, import com dot blah 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 dot star. Right? You're, you're just uh, importing the entire package, and but you're not specifying exactly which functions or uh, classes or whatever you're importing. Whereas the second line here, that's an explicit import. Uh, this is very important because there's nothing more frustrating especially to a Haskell newbie, to open a file, read the code, see the name of a function that you're not familiar with, and have no idea where the hell it came from. Because you look at the top of the imports, and they're all just uh, imp implicit imports. Right? And uh, uh, unfortunately, a lot of open source uh, libraries in Haskell right now do use uh, in implicit imports, and that kind of sucks. Uh, Haskell has a very, very high skill ceiling. If you, you know, there's the newbie, and then there's like the Haskell wizard, and the gap is very high. So you can, you can be, you can develop some really great skills in Haskell and write code that is really slick, really powerful, or really terse, really short. Um, but 
if you use those, all those powerful features, they're often more difficult to understand. And you don't really, you don't really need those features to get work done day to day. Uh, so here are some things that we actually, we chose not to use. Uh, we avoided these things. Uh, so in, in Haskell, there's such a thing as language extensions. Uh, they are uh, features that are added to the language that, uh, that roll out uh, with every release. Uh, and you can actually start using them before they're like officially turned on by default by explicitly saying, oh, I want to use this, 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 and that feature. And there are lots of features like this out there. And there are, some of them are very cool, very powerful. Uh, but some of the more advanced ones can get a little bit hairy, a little bit difficult to understand. So we made it a point to avoid the really advanced one. And the definition of advanced is kind of subjective. But we, uh, we kind of stuck with the level of type families. Uh, that's one of the extensions. Around that level of difficulty is where we kind of draw the line. Uh, we also um, tried using the operational monad once. I don't know if you guys are familiar with it. Didn't really work out for us. We kind of stayed away from that. Uh, this last one, I'm going to get flamed for. I don't, OK, yes. We stayed away from the lens library. <laughs> oh, damn. Uh, so learning Haskell and being comfortable with Haskell was difficult enough. You know, learn a whole new language, a whole new way of thinking. Uh, the lens library adds uh, another layer of complexity on top of that with all these operators, you know, the dot squiggly. And it, it's like another new language. Uh, and a lot of the things that the lens library did, like uh, uh, accessing deeply nested structures, we found like we, you know, we could, our structures went that deeply nested, and we could get away with uh, doing all the things that lens did just by doing using simple features, the basic features like pattern matching, our own, our own accessors, etc. So we chose to stay away from the lens library. All right, so so, so, uh, so we've gathered our changes. We've convinced uh, our undecideds, and now uh, we need to outrun our detractors. Um, it, was, uh, it was definitely a lot easier to develop in Haskell, uh, like I mentioned before, because we were on a microservices architecture. So the, the old world and the new world can uh, coexist side by side. You know, they can develop the Java stuff, we can develop the Haskell stuff, we'll talk over HTTP, everything's fine. Um, so we started this, this whole thing in June of 2014, and then by February of 2016, uh, about 50% of our services uh, was in Java, 50% was in Haskell. And, uh, and we did, in fact, uh, make some uh, FP-oriented hires. We hired two engineers with uh, direct Haskell experience, and we hired one more engineer with like general FP experience, and we did convert, me included, uh, two existing engineers. So at as of this point, about uh, maybe a third of the team was Java only, and maybe the other two thirds was like uh, Java and Haskell. Uh, now, our original intention was not necessarily to get to 100% Haskell. 50-50 uh, was uh, pretty good. Uh, so how did we get to 100%? Uh, well, as a startup, there's one way to do that, and it's ugly. It's to fire everybody. Uh, and in February of 2016, our company very nearly failed, and we, uh, we pretty much laid everyone off. Uh, we went down from 45 people to 70 people, and we and the only engineers that we kept on board were the ones who, in fact, knew Haskell. Now, this wasn't like we didn't like engineer this layoff to like get rid of all the Java people. The company <laughs> failed for like you know various business reasons. I'm not getting into that, um, but. Um, but we did find that uh, our system was trending towards Haskell already. And uh, in fact, our strongest engineers were our Haskell capable engineers. So it kind of just made sense to keep them. Uh, but all is not lost. Uh, today, we're looking much better. OK, thank you. Uh, we, uh, we're back up to about 23 total employees. Where our engineering team uh, are uh, we have eight engineers. Uh, uh, and all four of our backend oriented engineers use Haskell. Uh, using Kubernetes, we're actually no longer using uh, uh, Eureka. Don't fix Eureka. We're in Kubernetes, uh, about 100 or so pods, more than 100 pods of 15 microservices, uh, mostly Haskell. We do have one Ruby on Rails app. We have an R app that's doing our uh, 
machine learning. And we there are some legacy services still sticking around, but we're, we're working on those. So, uh, so how did it turn out uh, as far as our original goals of uh, being a 10 exchange, moving to F3, being a 10 exchange, and, uh, and using F3 as a recruitment differentiator? Uh, as far as being a recruitment differentiator, I think it absolutely worked. Um, we over over time we've had uh, five function uh, FP oriented hires, um, and we have in fact had candidates contact us uh, interested in working with us. Uh, we would, we've never had that before as a Java shop. Uh, and this is this this last point is a little like snooty and elitist, but uh, FP we found is generally a good a filter for good good engineers because. Uh, FP is just better. And if, if you're an engineer who is interested in functional programming, um, you, you have the good sense to recognize that it's better, and you probably expend an effort to learn it yourself because you know most, most companies uh, are OO only, probably not going to get to learn it on the job. So if you are a, a functional programming engineer currently, that probably means uh, you're pretty good. Uh, so what about? Um, FP as a 10 exchange. Well, this, this improvement was not as clear cut. Uh, we think that productivity uh, is improved uh, by 10x. We're not sure. Harder to measure. Um, uh, we think that feature development speed is about the same. As, as Michael Snowman mentioned this morning at the keynote talk, uh, uh, just, just talking about like MVP getting that first thing out there. Development speed is about the same. Uh, although, changes to existing code is a lot safer okay, because of the strongly typed system in Haskell. Um, though, uh, refactoring can be slower in some cases uh, because uh, specifically in Haskell, you really have to get the structure and the scaffolding right around your code. And if you want to make a certain change, that requires changes to the scaffolding, you really have to sit there and think for a while to think about what you really need, uh, and you have to get it right. Uh, because in other languages, you can get the scaffolding kind of wrong, but you can still kind of fake it, and it'll work. Haskell's not as forgiving as that. Uh, now, it's, it's, I think it's possible that we will see uh, more improvement as our system grows larger and becomes more complex. And, uh, well, because in a uh, in let's say Java or Python those languages, uh, the system uh, status gets worse as the system grows larger, grows more complex because well now you have to uh, rely on tests let's say uh, instead of the compiler to tell you when things go wrong. Uh, so it's well I, I suspect that we will see more gains in productivity as of, uh, compared to if we were using a language like Java as our system grows larger. Um, system stability has greatly improved. Uh, Haskell services generally are very durable, and uh, we don't have blobs in, that are littered with no point exceptions anymore. Uh, that is one of the most demoralizing things. You take a look at your log, you say you see NPE, 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 and you think to yourself, oh crap, is our, is our system just in a bad state at all times? What, what are we doing here, <laughs> right? Um, no more of that. And uh, developer satisfaction is quite high with Haskell. Uh, I mentioned that we do nowadays have a Ruby on Rails app. We introduced that into our ecosystem. And uh, all, the, all the people who worked on uh, like the first version of that, you talk to them and they're like, no, next project, please put me back on Haskell. So people, people really like Haskell. And uh, we're, we're working on moving bits of that Ruby app uh, back into Haskell. Uh, well, it's, but it's not always rainbows and butterflies. Uh, it's a compromise. And, there are drawbacks to using Haskell. Uh, errors are rare, but when they do happen, they are more mysterious because you don't get stack traces in Haskell. You know, when something goes wrong in Java, fine, it explodes, but at least it tells you, you know, what line and what line, blah, blah, blah. In Haskell, you don't really get that. So you, uh, you'll have to put in a lot more logging or try to reproduce the problem yourself locally in order to figure out what really went wrong. Uh, Haskell eliminates entire classes of errors uh, due to its strong type system, but it introduces a whole new other class of errors, uh, memory management errors, due to its lazy loading. These kinds of errors are generally rare, 
but it, it does happen and it does add a new thing that we have to think about. And of course, um, onboarding is going to be a little bit longer for people that you hire. Yeah. Uh, so what are some takeaways that you can take home back to your companies uh, in your quest, Sisyphean quest, to uh, get them to adopt functional programming? Um, moving to Haskell is like any other word change, like I mentioned before. Most of it is going to be political. It's, it's not a technical issue. It's a political issue. You have to do those three things. You have to gather champions, you have to uh, convince your undersiders, and you have to eventually outrun your detractors. Uh, it is definitely easier to do in a small company, uh, like any other kind of change, right? Um, and um, I, I just want to say that Haskell is definitely ready for production use. Uh, some people might still have the idea that, oh, Haskell is just an academic language. Um, well, no, there are some really great uh, production level frameworks and libraries. You can actually write um, RESTful web services in production, and because that's what we have. And we've been running on this for uh, three, four years. Um, some recent improvements in the Haskell ecosystem makes it like now is the best time to jump in and use Haskell. Uh, like I mentioned before, there's a really good learning resource now uh, the Haskell Program First Principles ebook. Um, there is Stack, uh, the build and dependency management system. It's really good. And um, uh, relatively recently, there is a really cool web framework called, called Servant that we really, really like. So now, do it now. Now's the best time. And um, getting management support was instrumental. Uh, I mentioned before that convincing our CTO and CEO to allow us to make this change was actually relatively easy for us. It was harder to convince the rest of engineering. Uh, but getting their support, the management support, was really instrumental. And one of the things you're going to need to do in order to convince your management is to let them know that if you go and make this change and then uh, some of you get hit by a bus, uh, you're, the company's not going to be screwed. Uh, you need to let them know and commit to having a critical mass of maintainers for this new thing that you're doing to sort of assuage their fears. Um, some more takeaways. Um, our advice is to use Haskell features conservatively. Um, you can actually get work done and um, realize all of the great uh, features of type safety and all that good stuff in Haskell without using all of the super duper fancy language extensions. Use your own judgment about which ones to use and which ones to not use, but uh, be just be cognizant that you are allowed to not use them. Nobody's going to laugh at you. Right. Uh, have an onboarding plan with resources and mentors at the ready to onboard people because ramp up is going to take longer. Uh, being on a microservices architecture really made the transition a lot easier uh, because the old and the new world can exist side by side. Uh, what we found, and I, I, I'd love to hear some comments on this, we found that the functional programming population isn't quite big enough yet to support like a 50 plus size engineering team of like just that few people. Uh, our team right now is like uh, eight people, half of them, four of them who do, do Haskell. Um, and we are trying to recruit in New York City, and we're finding that it's, uh, well, the population is maybe not quite there yet. So, uh, so be aware of that if you if you have you have dreams of rolling this out to like a really large team. Um, and functional programming is great, but maybe you won't perceive it as like an order of magnitude change immediately. It's going to take time to realize all the changes. Uh, so that was our story of how our small startup uh, transitioned to Haskell. Uh, I, I want to, for, for maybe some of you work in a much larger company, and you're wondering, well, how the hell am I going to do that with a large company? Uh, uh, I threw this in here to give you some information, uh, some tips on how to do that. Uh, so I actually, I, I worked for, uh, I did a stint at uh, Intuit in San Diego. Uh, Intuit is a, is a company in the US that does tax preparation software and uh, accounting software. It was uh, mostly like 99% a Java shop. Uh, uh, before I even got there, there was a, uh, and it, it's a very large company. Before I even got there, there was uh, uh, 
one, a few developers who were really into functional programming. And uh, in order to sort of evangelize functional programming, they, uh, order, uh, they organized a study group around functional programming. Uh, so after work, off hours, uh, you pick up, uh, they, they, they did Scala, they did Clojure. You pick a book every week, you do a chapter. And, then in, and in this way, they gathered their champions and convinced someone to sign it. Um, and uh, they successfully did that. They leveraged that, uh, that study group into like cajoling the management to let them use Scala for one of their systems as a team. So they went from only, only Java to now uh, one team is developing a few subsystems in Scala. Uh, and uh, eventually they also got hooked up with a local meetup, uh, the San Diego Functional Programmers Meetup. And, uh, and they also got into it to sponsor the meetup. They, they, they provide food, they provide you know, the venue, and, uh, and into it the company sees it as a recruitment tool as well to evangelize their brand. So that is, uh, that is how you can really get your company on board, especially if it's a larger company with functional programming. And that is our story. Um, here's my contact info. Uh, Adecto, we are hiring in New York City. We're hiring, hiring at Three Engineers. Uh, please come check us out. Thank you. I think we have time for a bunch of questions. Hi. So, did you when you we were talking about the effects that this language potentially could have on productivity, bugs, and everything like that? To what degree of rigor or systematization did you go to in order to track that? Uh, did you have any specific metrics you went over? Um, how did you judge whether or not productivity was, you know, improving or whether your bugs were improving? Um, what kind of usability metrics did you use or things like that? Unfortunately, zero. It's, just, it's my feeling, man. Well, I mean, so one, one really janky metric we looked at was just we compared uh, feature shipping time, right? And, you know, that's just one measure, and we found it, oh, it was about the same. So unfortunately, we don't have that rigorous data. Hi, uh, I have two questions. <laughs> yeah, first one is you talked about you know uh, the null pointer exceptions in the logs. Um, so when folks started using Haskell, so Haskell too has exceptions and even use types for indicating errors. So how did this exception thing, like Java developers especially, the writing functions, I mean, how did they choose? Did you see a lot of uh, exceptions coming out of the Haskell code which they wrote, or how how did that go? Um, no, we did not. Well, it's because Haskell's compiler is so strong. Like most of the things that would be exceptions, especially null pointer exceptions in Java, are caught at compile time. Right? Yeah, uh, I mean things like okay, you're trying to do a file I/O, if the file doesn't exist, it's throwing exceptions. There's certain yeah. Well, I mean if you know doing file I/O. If something goes wrong there, then yes, there will be an exception, and you will have to uh, handle it, catch it, and handle it like you would do in any other language. Okay, that so the, the exception handle. Okay. My second question was with respect to uh, stack and cable. So, what does stack give on top of like what? What's why? Why should someone use stack uh, instead of sticking in cable? Uh, you should totally ask Michael Snorman this question, and he will tell okay. you. Okay, but. Um, so from what I, and I'm not, I'm not an expert in this, but from what I know, in, um, when there was only Cabal in, back in the days of war, um, there's such a thing called Cabal Hell, uh, where you have in your file, in your Cabal, uh, Cabal config file, you've said that, uh, oh, my, my project depends on such and such uh, dependency and these versions or whatever. Um, but uh, builds in Cabal were not deterministic. So sometimes you, so because you specify a range, these are the ranges of uh, versions I want for this library. One build cabal might give you one version uh, in that range, another build it might give you another version. And the problem with that is um, the other libraries that you say your system depends on needs, uh, might depend on that library that's changing. So now those other dependencies don't compile, and now you're like, oh god, what happened? Why aren't they compiling? And this is cabal. With stack, um, 
you, uh, you specify specific versions of libraries that you use. And Stack provides uh, a list, a comprehensive list, very large list of a uh, bunch of commonly used uh, open source libraries out there that you might, uh, might be using. And this is a very large list, and they maintain this themselves. And they guarantee you that in version, in one particular list, all of these libraries work well together. And they will compile and they will work. Right? And, then, and then in a few days, and they, they update this weekly, every couple of days, a new version will come out. Here are some updated versions of these libraries, and we guarantee all of them work well together. So that's what Stack gives you. Uh, yeah, a couple of questions. Uh, one, you mentioned uh, scaffolding, and uh, you said sometimes you have to spend a lot of time at figuring it out, uh, and you have to get it right. Mm -hmm. uh, can you give us a little bit more sense in terms of what you mean by scaffolding? Is it is it the type classes you use? Is it is it a much bigger framework that you evolve? What is it? Yeah. Yes, exactly. So by scaffolding, I'm talking about the type classes. I'm talking about monad transformers, stacks, things like that. So those things can you have to get those right. Okay, uh, my second question is, uh, you talked a little bit about uh, productivity and you having noticed some productivity improvement but not 10x. Uh, is there a sense you developed at any stage that uh, in a different direction that you would need fewer or more people because you are working in Haskell as opposed to working in Java? So you're asking if um, we need fewer engineers to do the things that we do? Right. It, I mean, does, because uh, that's, a, that's a different measure, but it helps differently because if you get fewer people, uh, your uh, communication overheads kind of come down substantially. And, th and if that's one of the benefits that you are seeing, then that benefit is actually much bigger than it seems because then it, it, it really speeds up things. Uh, uh, even though you are having a few people and the time taken is the same, it still uh, probably has a different character to it. That's interesting. Um... I, I think, I suspect you're right, because our team is pretty small, uh, but we've done a lot of cool stuff, a lot of cool big things. Um, so you're, you're probably right. Um, although we are continually hiring, so it's not like we are, it's not like we are choosing not to hire more people because we think it's good enough now. Um, it, as a startup, you're growing, you're always hiring more people. Uh, uh, so from that sense, we're kind of blind to that kind of, uh, Hey, uh, did you end up writing the same code that you had earlier written in Java in Haskell? Did you end up re-implementing or because of your downsize or whatever, did you pivot and end up writing a new product completely? Um, during that transition, I, um, yeah, probably like 90% of the Haskell code we wrote was just new. Uh, but but maybe 10, 20% was replacing code set. So, okay, that's a smaller set, but any yeah. uh, comparison between the same code written in Java versus the same code written in Haskell? Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, yes, there, there is a comparison, and uh, we found the Haskell code is much better. Okay. It is um, generally shorter, more terse, uh, and is generally uh, more understandable right? because, because of the strong type. Uh, and just, just personally, I found that <clears throat> after I started programming in Haskell and I returned to programming in something like Python or Java, I feel like programming in Haskell has made me a better developer. Right? Now, now I see more of the, perhaps the warts of these other languages and it gets me angry. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> I, I try to bring the same um, good practices from Haskell into those languages whenever I actually program. Yeah, um, another question. You mentioned the hiring problem a little bit, and I, I've had some experience with this difficulty of hiring for these kind of positions. Do you have a, what is your methodology that you're using to find good people? Because I found even within FP, maybe FP is a good filter initially, but um, we're finding it even more difficult. We have to have an even stronger filter. So do you have any thoughts on how to improve the predictive power of your hiring process for success um, without doing something illegal? Right. Um, uh, yes, so it, it's difficult to find uh, people who already have FP experience, even more difficult to find people who have like specifically Haskell experience. 
Uh, what we found that was we generally have to hire smart people who are open to learning new things, especially in functional programming. Uh, uh, I mean, we're still working out the kinks in our hiring process. Uh, one specific thing that we like to do is we like to give our uh, candidates a, a small take-home project to do. Uh, uh, instead of asking them to come into our office and like whiteboard something like on the spot, because I, okay, this is, this, is, this is me ranting now. I hate those kinds of interviews because that, when during your regular job do you ever, does somebody walk in the room and says, write this code now, you know, and you have like an hour to do it. No, the way you write software is you, you sit, you think about it, and you plan it out. So uh, I think giving our candidates a uh, take home exam, or not exam, but project is the best way of doing that. So how do you evaluate how smart, quote unquote, somebody is in a legal fashion? Well, we take a look at their choices when completing that assignment. Uh, we, we, we leave a lot of it up to the engineer. They can choose their own language, their own framework, do make all these different choices, and, um, and we judge them. They're very judgmental in their choices. Um, and we're, we're judgmental about their justifications of their choices. Like, it's fine if you make a choice that we wouldn't have made, but uh, tell us about it. Tell us your, your thinking. Um, and also, we, we bring them in uh, for the interview, and we ask them to uh, uh, maybe fix some bugs that we found, uh, see how they do there, and just kind of talk to them. I mean, how do you, how do you find smart people? Uh, well, actually, one, one thing that I, I found is a good indicator is, can this person explain something to you? Right? Take, a, take a difficult, uh, difficult concept, uh, some really large project that they've worked on, and explain it to me uh, in, uh, in a concise way such that I can understand it. Uh, I think that is good. Hi. Uh, functional programming is great, uh, but I have a question. So, uh, yeah. so how much language choice matters for building great software? Because people have built great software using uh, very basic language such as C and C++. So how does it matter whether I choose a C, C++ or modern C Sharp or Java versus fun functional programming? Uh, wow, that's, that's, that's a question you would ask in this entire conference. Um, I think it absolutely does matter, right? I mean, you. Well, let me let's take this to the, to the extreme. If you were writing some kind of web services service, um, would you do it in a, an assembly, right? That would be crazy, right? So the, your choice of tool does matter, uh, and yes, there have there has been great software written well the ages, uh, uh, using various uh, various languages, but. Um, you have to ask yourself, were, was that software great in spite of the language? And how painful was it uh, uh, to develop that software? Like how much effort did you have to put in in testing and you know, refactoring and fixing things because you didn't have a strong type system? Like how much more productive would you have been if you use a different language? Hi. Uh, you mentioned that you wrote your own Netflix library in Haskell. Uh, how often do you still write your own libraries and how much time you spend contributing to upstream open source library because their state uh, is not that good or the state focus system is really nice nowadays? Um, well, I mean, I, I guess the, the, the question would be uh, for some kind of third party API, if they already do provide clients at all in some other language. Uh, how often would we have to write our own? Uh, well, na nowadays we're not uh, using that many third-party uh, APIs that provide clients in the first place, so we would have to write our own in the first place. So it's so it's hard hard to say because we don't always think of it, even if we were using Java. I have one last question here. Uh, so you said that ramping up uh, is a bit difficult. So do you think introducing Scala for Java developers eases out that learning curve, or is it just a mean to convince the business to move to FP? Um, well, I'm sorry. Are you asking is in order to solve the ramp up problem, would we should we use Scala and Haskell, or are you saying? Uh, basically, for the transition of from Java to FP. 
so like just the, the direct transition from java to haskell or like you said that one team got scala uh, for it so would scala be a better option um, from a technical point of view haskell superior yeah go haskell right? it's uh, i think it's better than scala however as a political option if you are at a big company that's you know difficult to change and you're on the JVM already, it might be too big of a task to move to something like Haskell. And if you want to do something like FD, you will have to do Scala. Yes, it's more of a business decision I think so. than the technical one. I think so. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I think that's all the time we have for questions. Uh, thank you so much for the talk, Michael. This is very, very interesting.